I'm joined now by Carl Bildt, a former foreign minister and prime minister of Sweden and a very long, a long-standing watcher of the situation in that part of the world. So, um, Carl Bildt, how delicate is the situation in Ukraine right now? If you look at the sheer number of trips, things look quite sensitive, but I'm not sure if that's a decoy. Well, we simply don't know. I mean, what, what we do know is that there has been a very significant build-up of military forces on Crimea for some exercises, but also around the borders of Ukraine. And the most significant military build-up since uh, the acute phase of the crisis in 2014 and 2015. And these are expensive uh, things. I mean, you don't do them for fun. They are there for a purpose, for some sort of, uh, some sort of thing. And, and, and that, of course, creates uh, a certain amount of nervousness. I imagine also that Putin will be testing Europe's response. Now, we saw that after the incident in Salisbury, um, Britain succeeded in getting Europe to give a, a combined response in when we expelled Russian diplomats. Um, but this time around, a few days ago, when Czech Republic um, expelled diplomats, there was not a concerted European response. Do you think that European unity is beginning to fracture? No, I don't think so. I think what has been happening in the sort of this Russia-Ukraine case now is that the fact that it has attracted so much attention and we had X numbers of telephone calls to Putin in the Kremlin and to President Zelensky in, in, in Kiev offering support, I think that has had a deterrent effect. It has been made clear to President Putin that were he to go further, uh, crossing the obvious red lines, that would have significant consequences. Um, so I think, as a matter of fact, the political action or the political signaling uh, that we've seen during the last uh, few weeks have probably, we have to reserve judgment, has pro have probably been successful. Right. But we've seen recently, for example, when, when Joe Biden came in, he was keen that Germany cancelled the Nord Stream 2 project that would link, expand the pipeline to Russia. The reason for that is that Poland and indeed the European Parliament were begging Germany not to go ahead with this because this would allow Putin great, far greater latitude to get up to more manoeuvres in Ukraine. Germany is still pressing ahead and that must be a little bit of a problem. That is a problem. Primarily, I think it's a problem for the German-American relationship. Uh, primarily, I mean, there's, uh, as, as, as you are aware of, there's significant opposition in Germany also to this particular pipeline. Uh, that being said, there is a significant opposition in Germany to the Americans doing sanctions against an ally. Uh, the Germans are saying, you can have different views on this one, but that is for us to decide, not for you to decide and try to impose your will. So it is, it is, it is uh, creating tensions. I, I think the the significance of the issue is somewhat overblown, uh, but uh, clearly it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Okay. Um, Vladimir Putin gave his annual address to the nation a few days ago, and in it he spoke about Russia as being a tiger surrounded by hyenas. Do you think that's how he regards Europe now, as hyenas to his tiger? I think he creates... Uh, uh... Yeah, I think he has that particular, I mean, my, my interpretation was, as a matter of fact, that sort of the tiger was more uh, the United States, play, perhaps, and then the other hyenas. But, but anyhow, um, that's obviously the way he, he sees it. Um, but otherwise, uh, I was surprised by his speech because it was so bland, as a matter of fact. Uh, difficult to see that he hadn't thought of the possibility of saying something of uh, relationship with Ukraine, but there was absolutely nothing in it. And that sort of invites a lot of questions. One of the theories that James Forsyth advanced in The Spectator is that Putin might be doing the build-up in Ukraine in order to de-escalate later and take some credit for it. For example, we now have got Alexander Navalny, who's very ill in a Russian um, prison. If something were to happen to him, then there would be big reactions, certainly from the West. But James is saying in that case, Putin might say, OK, I'm going to de-escalate Ukraine, and then somehow use that to assuage what would otherwise be a nasty, a far harsher reaction to the Navalny situation. I doubt there's any link between the two. I think the, the, these are two different developments. Uh, you can perhaps trace them back to the same common denominator, that is that sort of the nervousness in Russia over what's going to happen in September with the Duma elections and the internal instability tendencies that there are in the, inside the regime itself. But, but other, otherwise, I fail to see any connection with the between the Navalny crisis and the and the Ukraine crisis. We'll see if they de-escalate. I mean, there's a statement coming out of the 
uh, Russia Defense Ministry today that they are sort of starting to withdraw forces. Well, they've done that from Syria or announced that from Syria, I don't know how many times. So we'll have, um, we just have to wait and see what happens. How much of this do you think Putin is simply testing new leadership in the world? We've got Joe Biden, we've got new, um, new leadership in the European Union. Do you think he's just prodding to see how people react? I think he's primarily prodding the, the Ukraine leadership. I, I, I think he is irritated with Ukraine leadership. They have not, from his point of view, been delivering the concessions that he had been hoping for. And they have also lately taken some rather firm actions against his, uh, his close political allies in, 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 in Ukraine. I think that has irritated the, the Kremlin quite substantially. And I think the primary signaling here is uh, towards Kyiv. To a certain extent, perhaps uh, against Brussels and, and, and Washington, or they think rather that he believes that those those relationships are so rock bottom at the moment that it doesn't make much of a difference anyhow what he does. And what kind of signal do you think um, Kiev is getting from the from Europe in general? Because right now, if you see um, the Merkel government pressing ahead of Nord, Nord Stream two, then you do wonder just um, how important. Ukraine's protection, that, that Ukraine's um, part as part, part of the Europeans near abroad really is. It, it might seem as if Europe isn't really much of a position to do anything here at all because Putin's successfully playing one country off against another. Well, I, I think it's been a fairly unified response. There has been telephone calls from sort of from Chancellor Merkel, from President Macron, from President Inistri of Finland, and, and they've all been, uh, I understand, uh, very clear that if it crosses the red lines, there will be significant, uh, significant st steps taken by, by the European Union. Right, but, but can we define significant steps here? I mean, anybody can make phone calls. What kind of significant steps could we plausibly see the European Union take? No, I, I think that if, if there were to be sort of open aggression, I mean, that's the worst case analysis. First, there would be very close coordination between Brussels and, 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 and Washington, London, I would assume as well. And the measures that can be taken, those would be financial sanctions. I mean, the Americans took some, some action the other day. They were extremely mild. And, and I think one of the reasons the American sanctions the other day were so mild was that they, send, they want to send the message, well, we can do these things. And, and we have a lot of room left in, in terms of that. And if, 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 if that is done coordinated across the Atlantic, it can have a very significant effect on the Russian economy. And they know that. Right. But Putin annexed Crimea a few years ago. He's got away with that. He's been effectively wearing, waging war in eastern Ukraine for years now with something like 14,000 dead. He's also got away with that. So you can understand why he might think he might be able to get away with a little bit more before there's any serious response from NATO or from the EU or anybody in the West. But I think the sanctions that have been decided already, there's a lot of discussion always, have they worked or have they not worked? Um, they have not worked in terms of having him roll back and sort of give back Crimea and give back Donbass. He hasn't done that, but it hasn't gone any further. And, and, and I think that's a recognition of the fact that these, these sanctions have had an effect. They have an effect on uh, sections. I mean, they're not total trade sanctions by no means. But they have uh, they have a financial effect on, on access to financial markets. They have an effect to Russia's ability to uh, access certain key high technologies that they need also for their energy and other related developments. Um, so I think there's a there's an awareness of the fact that sanctions aren't killing Russia, but they are creating quite a lot of problems. Right, but I mean, domestically, Vladimir Putin seems to be quite, quite solid right now. The protests about Navalny's treatment do seem to be speaking for a minority of Russians. There was one poll showing a third of Russians think that he wasn't poisoned at all, a further 20% think that Navalny was um, the, the victim of some kind of Western plot. So it seems that um, domestically, Putin's pretty stable. Well, I, I wouldn't say pretty stable, but but I reasonably stable. I, what 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 you see is significant divide in Russia that is opening up between what I call the television generation. I mean, the elder generation that sort of are dependent upon what is said on television, and of course, what is said on television. I mean, we're all fairly aware of what is said on television in Russia. But then you have the younger the younger generation. That's the internet generation. They don't watch television. Um, they, they access uh, information through YouTube, which is, and, and there's also Telegram and, and, and related cables, uh, channels in, in, in Russia. 
So you see the internet generation being sort of increasingly sort of critical while the television generation, which is still bigger, uh, still sort of enthusiasm or reluctantly uh, supporting Putin. Mm -hmm.